Thank you all. Um, today, I'm just going to give a little brief update on the um, kind of vaccine, uh, the Biden administration's vaccine mandate litigation. Um, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the OSHA uh, mandate specifically, although a lot of the kind of same concepts and other things apply in other contexts where there's, you know, Medicaid, Medicare uh, recipients who have a mandate, as well as federal contractors that have a mandate coming down to the Biden administration. And all of these issues percolate into, you know, areas where states may have taken action, you know, municipalities or even private employers in some instances. Um, but I wanted to just give a brief um, overview of just kind of where we are at in that litigation, kind of what the OSHA requirement is, and then we can talk about how some of the religious organizations have been um, challenging this mandate and kind of what that means and maybe what those arguments look like and, you know, likelihood of success. Um, but OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, issued an emergency temporary standard, which I will call the ETS, on November 5th. Almost immediately, there was you know, a, a heap of litigation um, uh, because the ETS required all employers that have 100 or more employees to implement a mandatory vaccination or testing and masking policy within 30 days of that date. And then within you know, 60 days, they had to implement the testing and masking um, procedures. Now that ETS um, kind of applied generally, there weren't any exemptions necessarily at the institutional level, but at the level of employee, there are several exemptions um, for those that have religious um, objections, uh, they have a disability or medical issue, um, the worker is particularly isolated, for example, works at home or maybe in a remote location where they don't ex have exposure to other people, or they're like an outdoor worker working in like a lumber yard or something where they're not gonna have exposure. Um, um, but despite those exceptions, um, there, like I said, many lawsuits were filed, um, several, you know, in several different uh, appellate courts across the country. And, you know, a few days after that, in every single appellate court across the country, um, which raised the issue of which appellate court's going to decide this thing. Um, before uh, there was a decision as to which court would take on the appeal, all consolidated, uh, the Fifth Circuit issued an administrative stay, which said, hold on. Um, the CTS, we're going to keep this um, for a bit. Um, it's not going into order. And then just a few days after that, issued a full stay order. And that stay order criticizes pretty heavily the Biden administration, um, OSHA, and the ETS as being um, promulgated without authority or beyond the authority that OSHA and the act and the agency have for a few different reasons. There's some constitutional issues as well. Um, just a few days after that, all the appeals were consolidated into the Sixth Circuit, and currently pending in the Sixth Circuit case, where you know all of those uh, parties have been joined together. Um, there are a few different motions. The most kind of significant being um, OSHA's motion to dissolve the stay the Fifth Circuit entered. Um, briefing on that is continuing, and we don't know when the decision is going to be uh, rendered on that, or when we get to merits briefing. So that's kind of where we are generally in the case. As far as religious organizations go, um, most of the parties I will say are not religious organizations that are challenging or supporting the ETS, um, but there are several. Um, they include um, those like Answer in Answers in Genesis, which is kind of an online Christian ministry dedicated to kind of biblical Genesis type answers to questions of creation, evolution, science, that sort of a thing. Um, Sioux Falls Catholic Schools, a few other Christian schools, the Christian Employers Alliance, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, the Ashbury Theological Seminary, and the Word of God Fellowship, otherwise known as the Daystar Television Network, which has kind of been in the news recently as uh, their founder just died of COVID, which is relevant to this as well. Um, and there are some others that I'm not going to you know, give the full list here, but um, principally they're represented by Alliance Defending Freedom and then a few by First Liberty out of Texas as well. Um, and those Organizations also kind of have their hands in helping out some of the other non-religious parties in their challenges as well, um, for example, with different states um, and their AGs. So um, definitely there is a religious component to this case, um, if not you know, fully on the face and then kind of embedded into some other parties, organizations, briefs as well. Um, but principally the religious organizations are interesting um, because as we know many religious organizations, in fact, most religious organizations as an organizational level do not have an objection to the COVID-19 vaccines, um, although individual, you know, you know, 
religious adherents may. Um, so I thought it was interesting to just kind of drill down on exactly on how they're kind of anchoring the religious objection here. So for example, that Daystar Television Network, um, their brief in the supporting affidavit says that they interpret Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 13 to mean that the Bi if the Bible does not specifically address any issue, um, then Christians must allow their fellow Christians to reach different decisions on it and to follow their consciences on something that's not specifically addressed in the Bible. And if you don't allow them to, or you kind of put that choice to a test in one way or another, that is a sin because you're not allowing your fellow Christian to follow their conscience. And so because vaccines are not specifically addressed in the Bible, Daystar feels like that's a place where they cannot step in. So if they mandate a vaccine for their employees, um, even though there are religious exemptions that are possible, they are putting their employees to the test of conscience that they should not be putting them to. Um, and they think there are going to be adverse consequences to that. Um, some of the seminaries involved have similar objections, although not as specific you know, and rooted in biblical text, um, but that they wanna kind of support their employees' conscience and you know, what we would often call free agency um, as a really core concept to them. Um, they also note that there are some concerns about the vaccines being developed through a line of uh, fetal cell lines um, that have come through an abortion or other means um, way back when, maybe even like as far as the 1960s or something. Um, they don't really hang their hat on that, but they kind of note it's a concern that some of their employees may have. So it's, it's an interesting because it's not uh, the religious organizations taking the position that they you know, adamantly think the vaccines are bad, um, but kind of a step removed from that. But based upon those religious beliefs, they have argued that um, various arguments. First, that OSHA doesn't even have jurisdiction over religious organizations as employers under the OSHA Act, um, even though there are some regulations that affect that. And they're saying, you know, these regulations are defining things between secular and religious, um, and OSHA can't do that line drawing. It's just going to entangle them in religious issues that they don't have any authority to uh, adjudicate, just like judges would often not. Um, so that's kind of a practical argument about, you know, this not even being able to apply to any religious employers. And then they have some other arguments into the First Amendment, kind of citing church autonomy doctrine, um, their ability to control their own space as a religious organization, um, kind of plugged into that are some arguments under the ministerial exception that they need to be able to choose their ministers to promulgate their faith in the way they choose. Um, and then just kind of just broad free exercise generally, you know, the mandate will limit their ability to do what they want, continue their missions because it will restrict their resources or practically hamper who and what they can do. And then um, uh, they also do have an argument under RIFRA um, being that they are substantially burdened because the violations for not complying with the ETS are up to $14,000 per violation. Um, and then there's a big argument against uh, the ETS not being narrowly tailored or even the least restrictive means, even if there is a compelling interest, um, because there are so many other exempted individuals as well as exempted groups, primarily, you know, those employers that are not, uh, do not have more than 100 employees. And so those are kind of the objections that they're uh, putting on these uh, appellate briefs. Um, I think we'd likely see some argument against them in that there is a religious exemption, you know, explicitly in the ETS, which could, you know, give the employees an out. And so why shouldn't that be sufficient for everyone? I think some of the religious organizations have tried to argue against that, um, but to be seen. Um, the case is prominently focused on um, the non-religious arguments, constitutionality, authority, and some of the religious organizations themselves have chimed in on those arguments as well. Um, but the Fifth Circuit in granting their stay also did note, um, while somewhat in passing, that you know these liberty interests and religious freedom interests of the religious organizations should definitely be considered and may be just another reason um, that the ETS should be stayed or never be allowed to proceed. So that's kind of where we are with that. Um, Happy to answer a question or two if anyone has any. I've been tracking the litigation fairly closely, um, but ultimately it's kind of representative of the fights that some religious organizations are having with vaccine mandates across the country. Tanner, I have a quick question. This is Alexander. 
Yeah. Um, have any issues under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act been raised as potential kind of religious defenses against this? Is anybody making that argument? Yes, certainly. Um, I think that's most strongly made by the seminaries, although um, the Daystar Television Network has kind of said, we join in all those arguments. Um, I think, to me, those are the most persuasive arguments that are on the books, um, at least because they're so easily defined and we have a statute and we have some great case law determining um, you know, what sort of burden the government has to meet here. And the least restrictive means just doesn't seem like it's met here because there's so many exemptions, so many holes. Um, so that's gonna be a tough one to get over for the government, um, especially unless they can explain, well, you know, we have another ETS in the works for those under a hundred and, um, a lot of the religious organizations have said, what OSHA has done in the past is sufficient. Can I give us guidance? Tell us what we need to do to kind of make sure that we keep our employees safe, but anything you know, short of mandating vaccines would be enough. Thank you, Tanner. Other questions? Okay, well, feel free to reach out for me if you have any other questions, but it'll be really interesting to see how these progress. Thanks. Thank you.